Well, good evening. How's everybody doing? Good. Good. Um, just looking over the, the, the crowd here, I spoke up in uh, Minneapolis last week. And you know what? You're a lot better looking group than they are. <laughs> so this will work out really well. Um, some kind of housekeeping things. I only brought a few of these, but this is about the U.S. beekeeping industry. They're on this chair after, uh, after we're done, so they're available. And uh, if there aren't enough to go around, uh, you can email me. Just Google up uh, Jerry Hayes and, and Honeybees, and, and uh, an email address will come up. Just to kind of uh, piggyback on what Caitlin offered, um, I've been in the honeybee industry for about 35 years in, in various capacities and moved to Monsanto uh, about three and a half years ago. I did that because before that, I didn't say take one now. <laughs> no, go ahead. Okay. Before that, I was the chief of the apiary section, the honeybee section for the Florida Department of Agriculture. And uh, had uh, a variety of inspectors because Florida uh, has about 400,000 colonies of honeybees, those white boxes, various beekeepers, and it's uh, an overwintering place for commercial beekeepers as they spread their colonies throughout the United States for, for pollination benefits. But in 2006, this thing called Colony Collapse Disorder, CCD, was found on my watch in uh, Florida. And kind of in parallel with that, I was invited uh, uh, to a USDA workshop in my office in Gainesville, Florida, uh, that they were going to control malaria-carrying mosquitoes using a new technology called RNAi. I went to this uh, workshop and I thought this was kind of fantastic. It's a normal, natural process not GM, uh, not transgenic, uh, copying what is going on in you and I's bodies and, and many other plants and animals and livestock. And I thought, well, could we adapt this uh, to use for this new honeybee issue that came up, colony collapse disorder to maybe control some parasites or, or viruses. So on the way back from this workshop, I stopped at a colleague of mine's office at the University of Florida, Dr. Jamie Ellis, and said, Jamie, this is what I heard, what do you think? And so uh, we thought about it and thought it would be a good idea to start asking questions. We started asking questions and uh, there was a company in Israel called Biologics that was also working on RNAi to control a virus that was early on correlated with colony collapse disorder. So they found us, we found them, we decided to informally collaborate and learn about RNAi. Uh, this is a brand new technology in 2006, still new. Uh, two guys got the Nobel Prize uh, for this only a few years ago to figure out how this worked. Uh, and so we wanted to bring something to the honeybee industry that would perhaps bring back some sustainability to the industry. Monsanto acquired Biologics in 2011. And bless their hearts, they kept the honeybee piece. They didn't have to. Monsanto never had a relationship with beekeepers or beekeepers with, with them. Uh, but they wanted to keep the honeybee piece, learn about that, uh, learn about uh, honeybee health, and use honeybees as a platform to learn maybe how this could be used in, in uh, controlling other, other bad organisms or, or diseases. Monsanto uh, looked around their 22,000 employees and... Uh, Nobody knew anything about honeybees. <laughs> so they asked me if I would come and, and lead this effort. And I don't know about you, but it took me a couple months because Monsanto has some uh, bad perceptions many times. And I had them as much as anybody that Monsanto somehow was doing bad things. So talking to friends and colleagues and coming up here and talking to people, uh, which everybody was great, uh, I decided, you know, late career, that uh, I had nothing to lose, that had everything to gain. If we have a big corporation like this that wants to put time and effort and money and smart people and expensive equipment 
in the helping honeybees, my passion, let's give them a, trance, a chance and see what we can do. We'll succeed or we'll fail, maybe something in the middle, but it won't be for lack of trying. So what I want to talk to you about this evening is kind of an overview of honeybee health, uh, some things about RNAi, some things about uh, what we're doing there and kind of give you the, the big picture and uh, what am I supposed to be done? Right? 10 o'clock, all right, all right, okay, so they, they, lock, they lock the doors at midnight, is it? All right, so we'll, we'll see how, how far we get. So, anyway, uh, you heard from Caitlin. Caitlin and I had breakfast this morning. That's Caitlin's breakfast. Caitlin eats a pretty nice breakfast, like we all probably do in this country. She had, you know, a nice glass of juice and coffee and cream and toast and jam and some nice scrambled eggs and those wonderful, boy, and you just sampled a whole bunch of them back here, melons and berries and what have you, and, uh, you know, granola with the uh, nuts and the dried fruits in there. And I, you know, was eating breakfast. I wanted to see what Caitlin's breakfast would look like if honeybees hadn't been involved in her breakfast. That's Caitlin's breakfast without honeybees and that pollination benefit we'll talk about. Juice is gone. Honeybees take pollen from one flower part to another flower part so a seed can be fertilized and then that plant build a fruit around there that can be squeezed for Caitlin's juice, but it didn't happen. So that juice is simply gone. Coffee's still there. Honeybees pollinate coffee a little bit. Cream is gone because honeybees pollinate alfalfa, which feeds the cow, which makes the milk, which makes the cream. Jam's gone on the toast for the same reason. That relationship that honeybees have with these plants is gone, so that fruit wasn't developed that you can make jam of. And all those wonderful melons and berries are gone for that same reason. That linkage, that partnership between this pollinator and that plant did not exist, so that plant could not reproduce and provide us with food at the same time. And, you know, the wind-pollinated granola stuff is still there, but the nuts and the dried fruit are gone. That really, this is how important honeybees are directly in our lives because of food, but then also think of honeybees and their interaction in the environment and those same pollination benefits that they bring to wild plants that produce seeds and fruit and what have to feed wildlife. It wasn't too long in this country, we had about five million colonies of honeybees. Now we're down about two, 2.5, it's risen a little bit here in the last couple of years, but there's been a precipitous drop in honeybee colonization, colonies, and most of it's demographics, you know. None of us live on the farm anymore. Uh, we live in suburbia. Uh, there wasn't that need to keep honeybees. So the only real beekeepers you know, left are you know, commercial beekeepers and those die-hard hobbyists. So that population has dropped. So the question is, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Or maybe it doesn't make any difference. But I can tell you that our apiary, our honeybee industry, is under siege from a lot of pest predators and diseases that we didn't have when I started out in beekeeping. We have bacteria and, and gut parasites and external parasites and viruses and secondary predators and everything. So the beekeeping industry, beekeeping, honeybees are under a lot of pressure from many, many things that are relatively new. I've been on the Colony Collapse Working Group since its inception, 2006. And in that time, We've taken surveys of beekeepers in that window after spring, after winter into spring, to find out what their colony losses were. And if you added up all those and divided that by whatever it is, you're going to come up with about a 30, 35% loss of honeybee colonies, which is significant. If you're a small business person and you're losing 35% of your inventory every year, that's not a good business model. You can't go to the bank and say, I wanna borrow some money because the banker knows that you're gonna lose, you know, 30% of your business 
every year. They can rebuild that in a way, but this isn't sustainable. So we're on kind of a, a tipping point here of, of how our industry is going to go, and we have to do something better. Because there are more pollinator-dependent acres in the world than any time in its history. There are seven billion of us on the earth. And as far as I know, this is the first time we've done that. Going to eight, nine, ten. And we could probably go back to a wind pollinated diet, you know, rice and wheat and rye and oats and barley and what have you like our ancestors did, but you eliminate fruits and nuts and vegetables, it impacts our nutrition, it impacts diversity, and with this population growth, something we have to take a really, really hard look at. And you can make a laundry list of the reasons for these colony losses. Certainly this globalization and homogenization of pest predators and diseases, you know, you can get on a plane and in a matter of hours, be in another continent, in another culture, in another climate, in another region. And so we can ship around pest predators and diseases very easily anymore. And sometimes when they get into the United States, they really like it. My former state of Florida had a lot of new, well, Zika. And there have been a lot of other things in the past. Florida is kind of, uh, you know, the tipping point for a lot of these things. Lots of stuff likes to go to Florida. People from New Jersey is an example. <laughs> production agriculture. I'm not picking on production agriculture because we eat tremendously well in this country because of production agriculture. That's the model. But 5,000 acres of watermelon is not natural. You don't even see watermelons growing wild anywhere, do you? No. And so that model takes a lot of inputs to keep it going, but that's why we eat so well and have so much available at Schnooks and, and Deerberg. Production beekeeping, largest beekeeper in the United States, has 100,000 colonies. There are many commercial beekeepers with 5 and 10 and 12, and that model is as unnatural as 5,000 acres of watermelon. <clears throat> Takes a lot of inputs to keep that going. Where do you, where do you put 10,000 colonies of bees? You can't put them in one location. Pesticide misuse? Certainly. Who here, tell the truth, has seen some bugs at your house. They were, they were big. And the label says a teaspoon per gallon in your sprayer. And you're thinking, oh, that's a really big bug. Maybe I'll just put in a little bit, a little bit extra. We've all done it. And, you know, that same thing. If you don't read and follow label directions, they're there for a reason. And those can impact not only honeybees, but other beneficial insects as well. Eliminating productive locations to place honeybee colonies. Our population's growing. Seven billion. I guarantee you, and I'm not picking on St. Louis Library System or the houses around here, I'll guarantee you 50 years ago, this didn't exist here, did it? So. We have to grow the population, but we have to have those balances and offsets that allow our environment to grow and be sustainable as well. Entomophobia, fear of insects. Who here is a beekeeper? Raise your hand high. Don't be embarrassed. Golly, guys, come on. All right, I'll bet you two beekeepers you know what? If you're a beekeeper, have a love of beekeeping, and you put some beekeep beehives in your backyard, as much as your neighbor has a warm fuzzy for honeybees, they want to save the world, they want to, you put honeybees next to their house and it changes. And they're going to call somebody. 
So fear of insects. Low honey prices. Many other countries can produce honey cheaper than we can, but there is a lot of benefits to local regional honey. Low pollination prices. Beekeepers travel around the United States taking their colonies to this production agriculture. For instance, uh, almond production in California. <coughs> Million acres of almonds. California produces 82% of the world's almonds. Requires two honeybee colonies per acre to pollinate those almonds so that they produce a crop. About 8,000 pounds per acre. They pay beekeepers about $200 per colony to take their colonies from all over the United States. Remember, one million acre, two colonies, two million colonies. We said we only had about 2.5. So they loaded on semi semis and take them across the United States. And $200 is an overhead. Not any different than irrigation or fungicide treatments or anything else. Bees are looked on as an overhead, even though without honeybees, this is their crop. So that impacts if you have a small business, moving these bees around and being paid for that service. And so we'll talk about the colony collapse disorder issue real quick. Uh, the bees are gone. You can see there's bees there, but that's not as many honeybees as normally in a colony. The bees are gone. They're not dead on the ground. They're not dead on the bottom board. They're just gone, like they've been beamed up or something. And there's a, a definition that we came up for CCD. It takes about two honeybees to raise one baby bee. When that ratio changes, that's one of the symptoms. And the queen is still present. Social insects don't leave their only fertile female. That's their genetic future. But they do leave her and leave her behind. And there's very low of these secondary predators uh, and parasites. This is what we have found, though, over the years as the number one problem in honeybee colonies. The parasitic varroa mite accidentally introduced into North America from an Asian species of bee, a cousin of our European bee. It's a huge, huge parasite. Everybody humor me, make a fist. Put it someplace on you. Proportionally, this is how large a varroa mite is to a honeybee's body. It's a huge, huge parasite feeding on the bee's hemolymph, its blood, leaving open wounds, vectoring pathogens, causing immunosuppression. It would be like you having a parasitic rat on you, sucking your blood. So it's significant. Think of Roe as a dirty needle. Every time it pierces the honeybee's cuticle, it's vectoring these viruses, leaving open wounds, infections. About 38 or so viruses that are associated with honeybees. And the crazy thing and the reason I'm at Monsanto is because beekeepers, the only thing we were given, and it saved the industry, it saved the industry of pesticides. Beekeepers have to put pesticides in a honeybee colony to kill a little bug on a big bug. If you don't do that, if you just leave them alone, that colony will be dead in 18 to 24 months weakening as it goes along so it's of, of no value to the beekeeper after a while. And so these uh, pesticides are uh, delivered in a variety of different ways. But if you think of a honeybee, if you can visualize a honeybee, it's small, it's furry because it wants to pick up that pollen, uh, and these chemicals get on the bee trying to get in contact with these varroa mites. The bees groom each other and groom their sisters, kind of like cats, uh, and ingest some of these chemicals. And so there's collateral damage. You can dose down these miticides, but there's always that chronic exposure to them. Save the industry, but we got to do something better. 
This is just a graph of chemical residues found in, in a beehive. Those first two are active ingredients and in two of the miticides, the pesticides that beekeepers found in 100% of every colony tested. Honeybee colonies, if you can picture this also for you non-beekeepers, that comb that bees live on, that's made of beeswax that the bees make themselves and construct into that architecture. That's a fatty acid. And as a fatty acid, it absorbs chemicals that the beekeeper puts in and that the bees are exposed to as it's foraging. And sequesters those, hangs on to those in that comb forever. And so the bees are exposed to many, many different things 24-7, 365. I remember in Florida, there was a commercial beekeeper that early on in Varro was treating uh, with some miticides. And after a while, the queen, who's the only female who lays the eggs in the colony to make more baby bees, wouldn't even lay eggs in the comb. She said, I can't do this anymore. There's just too much junk in there. And he had to burn 10,000 of the frames that go in the beehive because they were contaminated. Think of bees as a flying dust mop. Honey bees can forage in about a two, two and a half mile radius of their colony. That's a long distance. And they're small and they're furry and they're designed to pick up sticky flower pollen and transfer it around. But they also pick up lots of other things and bring them back to the colony from all sorts of different places. You know, from the roadside, from the golf course, from production agriculture, from your yard, um, you know what, every place. But honeybees have been exposed to toxins forever. Plants produce toxins. Plants produce poisons so that bad bugs won't eat them. And honeybees are exposed to those and they have some mechanisms to deal with those, break those down. But when you have this additive effect of things like this and those miticides that beekeepers have to use, they use up these enzyme systems pretty quickly. And because they're such short-lived animals, they don't rebuild those and, and readjust very well. There's another example of this pie chart here. These are this is about uh, chemicals that honeybees are exposed to and bring back to the colony. And there's, you know, there's fungicides and there's herbicides and pyrethroids. And here's, I think it's about 3% neonics. You know, everybody thinks neonics are bringing it into the world. Probably not. This right here, about 42, 43% of all chemicals found in a beehive are the ones that beekeepers put in a beehive. And so what's the synergy? When you put all these things in a beehive and mix them together in a beeswax matrix, what happens? Nobody knows. There's too many things to test. You can't do that. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Probably not a great thing. So, now we're going to talk about RNAi because we got to do something different than these synthetic chemicals. All right. We're going back to high school, or for some of you, going up to high school, <laughs> right? Everybody knows what DNA is, right? Yeah. All right. <laughs> if I make a mistake, who said that? He did? If I make a mistake, correct me, okay? I appreciate it. So DNA is the code for you, the recipe for you. Everything about you, everything is coded in DNA. Everything. You know, what enzymes your cells are going to make, uh, what proteins, how big your nose is, um, is your belly button an innie or an outie? All that stuff is in DNA in the nucleus of every cell of your body. The complete code for you is in the nucleus of every cell of your body. But you know what? DNA never leaves the nucleus of the cell of your body. 
So how the heck do those instructions, that recipe, get from DNA in the nucleus to that cell site so that something can happen, so that something can be turned on or turned off or what have you? Well, there's a couple guys by the name of Mellow and Fire that got the uh, Nobel Prize for this in 2006, I think it was. So, give me a chance here to try to give you an analogy. So, you got to have information to make an organism, make an organism function, what have you. So my analogy is going to be a dinner recipe. Think of DNA as a stack of cookbooks. Lots of recipes in a stack of cookbooks to make all sorts of different kinds of food. Food you can eat, but they're all different foods. Specific set of instructions, so you pick out what you want to do. I picked out grilled Thai beef salad. So I picked that one recipe out of one of those recipe books to make a specific meal, a specific product. But that recipe can be modified or changed slightly depending on the needs. So I'm inviting people over to a dinner and I find out one of my guests is a vegetarian. So I change that recipe slightly by taking out the beef part of that. Now I didn't change the recipe, I just eliminated that part. So I didn't make Vietnamese beef salad or Thai beef with chili or beef tartar or cop salad or anything else. Same recipe, I just change it slightly. All the other guests are okay with it. Well, it's the same thing with plants or animals or you. This is going on in you right now. Certain things have to be turned on or turned off and you slightly change that recipe slightly from the DNA to make something happen in your cells and in your body. And this whole thing is called interference. RNAi, the I stands for interference because it interferes, it turns off something. If the eye is not there, it turns something on. And these two guys figured this out in 2006. So back to my meal. Everything's going good and then I get another note. Don't make the Chinese broccoli because my third guest hates it because his mom made him eat it all the time. do I make or do I dial it back make a little bit of that and maybe some more of protein B same recipe but just minor direct focused changes normal biological process that's going on in you right now and you guys eat it all the time you just ate some that apple slice is full of RNAi because that's how that apple talked to its cells to make that apple so juicy and nice. It's in there. We're breathing it right now because there's bacteria and fungus in the air. That's how they talk to themselves. It's ubiquitous. We've been exposed to it. It's in our bodies. It's being used all the time. So this is nothing, nothing foreign. And so, this sounds like a new concept, and some of it is, but it's going to be adapted, and, and uh, some of it is already in use in agriculture today. I think this is a good example. The Simplot company is going to use RNAi to turn off an enzyme in potatoes so that when that potato is bruised, it doesn't bruise. And if you can do that, 
you can save about $90 million in production costs because you don't have to make more potatoes to fill what has been ruined. You save about 60 million pounds of CO2 emissions, 7 billion gallons of water, and you save about 170,000 acres of farmland from pesticide exposure because you don't have to grow more from scratch. 400 million pounds of waste, potato waste, could be recovered just with this one change by not having a potato bruise and get nasty and start rotting on you. There's an oil out there right now called Vista of Gold. And what they've done is from soybean, soybean oil, a good oil, but it's not as good as, say, olive oil it has a, a, a higher oleic capacity. And so they've changed that. So this soybean oil is more like olive oil, but it comes from soybeans uh, because they've changed the oil structure. Papayas years ago in Hawaii are controlled, uh, control a, a virus since 1998 using RNAi and other examples are squash and plums and, and beans that use this technology to enable a virus to be turned off or uh, bacteria to be affected so that they can continue to grow. And so now what's being worked on is corn rootworms, earworms, corn, huge crop, I think 94 million acres or something of it last year, that has to be chemically treated in order to stop these corn rootworms from eating the roots and then of course affecting yield. And so if you could use RNAi to control this corn rootworm, you could eliminate or reduce the amount of those pesticides having to be used and having to be put into the environment. And there's many other things. There's Colorado potato beetle and weed management and uh, virus control and everything else that potentially RNAi could be used to reduce chemical inputs to the system. And for honeybees, we think that we can kill, hurt, or damage varroa mites and maybe even the viruses that they vector. I don't know if you see this. You see that honeybee's wing right there? Yeah, that honeybee, that isn't a real good wing. Uh, this honeybee has gotten a, def a virus called the foreign wing virus from the roa mite, and that wing won't work. So this honeybee isn't a honeybee. She will die soon. She can't fly. She can't do anything. Um, and so if you could control varroa mites and some of the viruses that are affected with this varroa virus complex, you would really bring a lot of health back to honeybee colonies in a safer, saner, sustainable way. So the big question is, are RNAi safe? Yeah, we've already talked about this. It's everywhere. It's in the food you eat, it's in you, it's in your dog, it's in your cat, it's how their, talk, their cells talk to each other. It's, uh, it's everywhere. Uh, we've been exposed to it for forever. And when these products are tested, they're also tested on non-target organisms, you know, the worms and the other bugs and what have you, because even though this is targeted and focused, you want to be sure that what you're targeting and focused uh, those genes aren't in some other organism that's related somehow, somewhere. So they're tested on many, many other non-target organisms just to be sure that they will be as targeted and focused as, as we hope they will be. And honeybees, of course, are in this because they're so important uh, to uh, our agriculture production and the environment. And they're fed uh, thousands and thousands of times more of this material just to be sure that they're going to be okay and unaffected. And uh, has very favorable mammalian uh, profile, doesn't hurt us, doesn't do anything to us. If you're focusing on a, a varroa mite gene to turn it off, to kill her, to damage it, you don't have that gene in you. And so it doesn't affect you. In fact, They've tried to use RNAi 
on humans to control some of our diseases and it doesn't work very well because we have so many different layers of our immune system it's recognized and, and eliminated. They had some stuff for uh, macular degeneration but they had to inject it into your eyeball in order to do it because it couldn't get through your body system. And of course the, you know, the regular mite uh, exp uh, mice uh, exposure and what happens to mice uh, nothing happens to the mice. And so RNAi has been around forever. New applications may help fight pests and diseases in a different way, non-GM, non-chemical. And it has a positive environmental profile. So th these are our areas of focus in the honeybee industry. Honeybee challenges, primary stress. I don't know what honeybee stress is, but loading 480 colonies on a semi-truck and driving it to California is a stress. Different time zones, different altitudes, deep breathing diesel fumes for three days, all that kind of stuff. Rural mites, of course, we got to do something about that. And then management, nutrition, pesticides, and if you don't take care of those, that's when those secondary pathogens and predators move in uh, to take advantage of this weakened honeybee colony so that they can raise their babies. So this is honeybee health. This will be on the test, so play, pay attention. <laughs> but you can see there's a lot of moving parts to honeybee health. You know, there's ag practices and monocultures and acreage and chemical use and drift and what happened to beneficial microbes because honeybees uh, are impacted by those as, as well in a positive way and residues in the beehive and beeswax and miticides and antibiotics and pathogens and climate and beekeeper pack. If all these are working together, you have a healthy, robust honeybee colony that will do what we want a honeybee colony to do, and that's pollinate and produce honey. If one or two of those things are out of whack, a healthy honeybee colony will kind of take a deep breath and figure it out and readjust. If you have any more of those, that's where we're seeing that 30-35% loss of honeybee colonies over the winter. They can't adjust. They're not healthy enough to adjust. This is honey. Hopefully everybody loves honey. It's wonderful. It's great. Just think of this relationship that honeybees have with plants. You know, plants produce a flower with pollen that they want transferred, but bee, they they produce a little bit more, so bees can use that as a food as well. Nectar, a sweet sugary syrup that is kind of a bribe for honeybees and other pollinate, pollinators that come to move that, that pollen. And, and this relationship has developed over millions of years because, let me see if I can word this right, I usually word this differently. Plants can't get up and walk around and mate. They have to have a honeybee do it for them. If the honeybee isn't there or other pollinators, they can't mate, they can't reproduce, they can't produce a seed. They, they go away. They die. Their genes stop. And so this relationship between this insect and a flower is fundamental to health of our environment. And as beekeepers, as people, they've allowed us to enter their world. How many insects do you want to have a good feeling about? You love cockroaches? Who wants cockroaches in the kitchen? Bed bugs. No, see what I mean? But we have this insect that's helpful. And then we as beekeepers are a little bit different. We like an insect. And an insect that will hurt you sometimes. Which is, you know, if they want to spend some research money, they ought to do some type of psychological profile on us oh. beekeepers. That would probably be very interesting. <laughs> Honey, wonderful product. Different, different flowers produce different sugars and tannins and flavonoids, but this is why honeybees are important. That's a honeybee with pollen grains on her. Pollen grains containing the male element in there that when delivered to a certain flower part will deliver sperm 
and allow a seed to be fertilized and allow that plant to reproduce with a fruit or something that we may be able to eat as well. Whole foods. Great, uh, you know, produce section. Whole foods without honeybees. Significant, tremendously significant of how we're dependent on a bug and how we need to be more aware and grateful for that relationship. And just to kind of nail this down, this is kind of the circuit that commercial beekeepers go through as they travel around the country because, remember, we have more pollinator dependent acreage than ever. There are not enough honeybees in any one state to take care of the pollination needs. So this industry is kind of a gypsy lifestyle where they travel around the country. Growers pay the beekeeper to bring the colony so they can produce a crop. And they do this from spring until fall and then they start it all over again as they build up their colonies over winter time. <coughs> Hard, hard. One of the last hard, dirty jobs. That's just a forklift loading beehives on a semi. Beehives in almonds in California. Two million colonies. And if you don't have complete pollination, let's say that you have varroa mites. We talked about if you don't treat for varroa mites, your colony is dead in 18 to 24 months. But that colony gets weaker and sicker in that interim time. And so you can have honeybees, but you might not have enough. And if you can see this watermelon here, only about one half of it got pollinated, those seeds. Say a watermelon's got 500 seeds. A pollen grain has to be associated, one pollen grain has to be associated with each seed in order to fertilize it, or that watermelon is under no obligation to build a watermelon in that site. If it doesn't, you get a funky shaped watermelon or a funky shaped cucumber. Do you ever see any of those in schnooks? No, no that's food waste. 40% of our food's wasted in the United States. It's crazy. And one of the reasons is that we have to have stronger, healthier honeybee colonies. Oh, here, let me go back. I love this one. All right, China. It's got about 10,000 hectares of pears. They've used so many chemicals that beekeepers won't go there and none of the native pollinators are alive. So they hire people in the rural areas to climb up in the pear trees with goose feathers and pretend they're a honeybee. Going from flower to flower to flower. Who wants to volunteer for that job? <laughs> this is what I say. We have it. We have it so good here, folks. I hope you know that. So one of the first things I did when I started at Monsanto is I didn't want Monsanto to just listen to me. I wanted to get some third-party confirmation. So I formed a Honeybee Advisory Council of Dr. Dennis Van Ingle Dart, the University of Maryland, Gene Robinson, University of Illinois, Dave, Mend Dave Mendes, a big commercial beekeeper and past president of the American Beekeeper Federation, Gus Rouse, honeybee queen breeder, because we talked about honeybee queens, there's a whole subset of the industry that just raises honeybee queens. He raises about 400,000 every year. Larry Johnson, a commercial beekeeper, and Pete Berthelsen from Pheasants Forever. What we do is we meet a couple times face to face every year, have uh, conference calls because I want to be sure that whatever we do at Monsanto is going to be bring value to the industry, product concept, uh, what's being controlled, how it's being controlled, and how we're approaching this so that we stay on course, we stay on the path. We partner with Project APIS-M. As you saw in the almond groves, did you see any flowers blooming there? No, that almond pollination is in February and as wonderful as California sounds, there's nothing blooming in February in California. So, Project APIS-M partnered with almond growers to plant some early spring things, mustards and what have you, that could add some additional nutrition for the honeybees. 
And then we had a Honey Bee Health Summit a few years ago where we brought in leaders of the industry and USDA and EPA and everything else to Monsanto uh, to talk about how Monsanto can help the industry and how the industry can help Monsanto. This partnership that hadn't existed before now exists in the form of the Honey Bee Health Coalition because after the summit everybody said, wow, this was great. We want to keep doing this. So how do we keep doing this? And you know what? And anybody who says they do anything positive by themselves is a liar. You have to work with other people in order to get things done. Use their knowledge, skills, and ability. That synergy that only comes from getting a whole bunch of people with the same passion around the table. So we started a Honeybee Health Coalition of lots of different members to talk about hive management and burrow control and forage and nutrition and crop pest management and outreach and education and these are some of the members of it that there's about 40 members right now that sit around the table and talk about how we can help the honeybee industry and we've already produced a tools for varroa management guide and a pesticide reporting guide we're working on forage and nutrition projects all because these folks here and their organizations want to help the honeybee industry. And why is this important? You guys all know this, honeybees are important. You can put a dollar figure on it, which is what business people look at, but think about the environmental impacts of honeybees and how they help the environment make that sustainable. But you know, did I just suck up uh, 45 minutes of your time because we all know where food comes from, right? It comes from the grocery store. <laughs> they grow it in the back. That's why they have those doors. You can't see back there. No, it comes from farmers. It comes from agriculture. It comes of all different sizes. It comes from your backyard garden. It comes from your friend's backyard garden. It comes from the people that you shop at the farmer's market with. This is where our food comes from. And it's a complex relationship to grow the amount and bounty of food that we have in the United States. And one of the components of a healthy food system are honeybees and other pollinators. That's me, if you need to get a hold of me. So we've got some time for questions and answers. Um, what I'd like you to do is if you have a question, uh, raise your hand. I'll point you if you would stand up, introduce yourself, and if you could give me your credit card number and that little number on the back, <laughs> I would appreciate it. Let's take Dr. Hayes real quick first. Yeah, uh, my name's Eric Zust. Uh, the bar chart that you showed that showed the contaminants in the beeswax, I believe. Is there, are those contaminants also in the honey? They, they can be. Honey is, an, is a, a product that has an acid profile. It's, it's slightly acid. And so if that honey is stored in the combs that also are sequestering those chemicals, it can be drawn out and it can be leached out into the, into the honey. And so, uh, for instance, our biggest honey co-op in the United States is Sioux Honey Co-op, and so they, they test for those. One of the problems has been honey coming from overseas that may not have as, as many regulations as, as we do uh, and circumventing those. So I, there again, I would look up local regional beekeepers for your honey because I would have much more confidence in that than I would anything else. Yes, sir. I'm Jerry Castellan. I was wondering, with the RNI, RNAi, is that a form of a, of a mutation that comes from the DNA, or is it it's no, like so, a form of natural selection that's got to be? Yeah, no, so it's every, every there again, uh, DNA makes a copy of that instruction that that cell wants to do or the body wants to do. Its cousin, RNAi, takes it, that instruction from DNA, to that cell site and turn something on or turns it off or dials it down or what have you. So it's not a mutation, it's just a way 
of the body um, conversing with itself to tell the cell what it wants to do to make that organism, that biology, efficient and effective so you stay alive. But that's what all RNA does, right? It's all, all RNA does that, whether it's I or not, right? Exactly. Yeah. I just turns things off. Yeah, I stands for interference. Yeah. So you have on and off. Or a little bit of on, a little bit of off. Ooh. Somebody want to play with the dimmer switch for me back there? Think of RNAi as a dimmer switch. You're not helping me, Caitlin. Come on. That's terrible. I don't know what I'm doing. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. I was wondering, do you know how much crosstalk there is between the R and the I from one species to another? Yeah, and so that's why we look at um, non-target organisms because when, for instance, on honeybees, we want to control the varroa mite. The, honey, the varroa mite genome has been sequenced. The honeybee genome has been sequenced. And so you can pick out in the varroa genome um, those unique parts, because every organism is unique, that doesn't match up with honeybees, uh, and then target that in the varroa mite so it doesn't hurt honeybees. But then you have all this other testing uh, for non-target organisms just to be sure that they don't have that compatible. If you do, it's targeted, it's focused, it doesn't hurt anything else, and it's pretty effective. Yes, sir? So you have to stand up. I can't hear you if you don't stand up. Well, honey be pollinated uh, one kind of flower with another flower is pollen. Would it do anything to affect another flower? No, and so that's where, you know, flowers have to be the same species or they can't mate. So a watermelon, so say a honeybee, and this is why honeybees, when they're out pollinating, they generally stay on that same flower, that same species, because they say a honeybee went to a male watermelon flower, picked up pollen, and then flew across the field to a dandelion flower. That won't work because it's a different species. Yes, sir. Um, so I was kind of curious. When you were talking about RNA and your efforts in RNA, are you looking to stimulate certain types of RNA uh, production, or do you synthesize messages that then you add back in? Yeah, so what, so what we're doing is the honeybee, uh, honeybees at this time of the year are very short-lived, six to eight weeks. And because honeybees are so short-lived, um, um, evolution hasn't given them a lot of um, immune system power. Um, and so the honeybees try to control the varroa mite by turning things off RNA, but it can't make enough of it. So what we're doing is basically copying what the honeybee would do, make more of it, put it in sugar syrup, feed that to the honeybees, and theoretically um, the honeybees will ingest it and when the varroa mite feeds on the hemolymph, the blood of the a honeybee, then it will be exposed to this RNA. And the, and the biggest problem we're having right now is because RNA is a normal natural product. I'm going to use the wrong terminology, but it's amino acids. And what happens is um, it doesn't last very long. If you put RNAi in sugar syrup, like beekeepers sometimes feed sugar syrup to bees, um, it's full of bacteria and fungus and yeast, and they eat it as food. They recognize it as food. You spill it on the ground. It's gone in about 36 hours because bacteria and stuff eat it. So that's a good thing. It doesn't last very long in the environment. The bad thing is how can we make it last longer so it actually has some effect in the honeybee for varroa mite control. So you're actually copying the existing RNA in the immune system and then just kind of amping that. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Cool. Uh, John Smith. So John Smith, really? Yeah. Did you like discover or something? <laughs> You're younger than I thought. You said that the varroa mite was introduced. What species was it parasiting on before? And is there any GM stuff that we could take from that? Yeah, and so great question. So uh, Asia um, has various species of honeybees. Our honeybee, our European honeybee, is Apis mellifera whatever kind, you know, Ligustica if you want Italian bees. 
in Asia, they have Apis serrana. And the difference between the two things is Apis serrana in Asia, because most of Asia is tropical or subtropical, has very small colonies. It doesn't produce a lot of honey, maybe, uh, maybe a kilo or two every year. When folks in Asia found out about European honeybees and then maybe storing 100 pounds, you know, 50 kilos of honey, they wanted some. So they brought European bees to Asia and the European bees and Apis serrana that had varroa mites coexisted for several decades together. Varroa didn't automatically try to parasitize uh, the European honeybee. Varroa on Apis serrana is a good parasite, doesn't kill its host. They have some mechanisms, small colonies, they groom themselves a lot, and the varroa mite only reproduces on Apis serrana on drones, which are the males of Apis serrana. So, they existed uh, all together and everybody was happy for a while until, you know, life finds a way. Female varroa mite figured out how to reproduce on European bees. And not just the drones, but the workers. That's the problem. If they had just stayed on the drones, this would be easy thing. But they've parasitized the workers and they're a bad parasite because any new, any new organism that has a new parasite and they don't have a relationship, they always die. That's what happened. And so because of moving honeybees around, these new European bees that Varroa had learned to parasitize learn to reproduce on, were moved around Asia, worked their way into the Soviet Union, and then into Europe, and then over to the United States. So it's, it's going on everywhere. You can only have one question. Okay. Has the uh, Asian honeybee migrated to the U.S.? Oh golly, no. We don't want that here. Uh, we don't want, I mean, one of the problems is we don't want any other pest predators or diseases brought over. Number two is um, they're, they're small bees, small colony, they don't really bring any benefit. And, and our European bees and Apis serrana um, mate, but they produce a mule. Um, and so somebody would die out over time. So we don't, we don't want to, we got enough problems. Yes, ma'am. How do honeybees generate honey? Great question. So the question is, how do honeybees generate honey? So, every flower produces what's called nectar. And nectar is a sweet, sugary liquid. It's very nice. And the bees go to the flower and suck up this nectar and take it back to their colony in their hive and they put it in their hive. Now this nectar has a lot of water in it. And so if you just left it with a lot of water in it, it would start to rot. Sometimes they call that fermentation. And so what the bees do is they evaporate the water from the nectar down to about 18 or below 18% moisture. And because of that, it's very thick, it's sticky, and organisms can't grow in it. Uh, and so that's how we have honey. And, and that's how we have honey. But bees produce it for themselves because they're European bees and they're always preparing for winter. And in winter, you don't have any flowers blooming. So they want to save that honey for something to eat over winter. Make sense? So how do honeybees sleep? How do they sleep? So they really don't sleep like you. What they do is sometimes when they get tired in a hive, they'll just, they'll just stop. They don't, and they can't close their eyes because they don't have any eyelids. Have you seen your dad when he falls asleep on the couch? Huh? Have you? With that snack in his hand? It's kind of like that. Okay. We'll be here for a while.
It depends on the load of nectar that that plant is producing or pollen. And so in a good day, maybe a couple 200, 300 flowers, um, it, can, it can visit and, and, and yeah, do what it needs to do. It's, it's trying to survive. Honeybees are always preparing for winter, and as a side benefit, it pollinates these plants. Yes, sir? Do any other insects pollinate? Oh, golly, yeah. There are about 4,000 different species of bees in the, just in the United States. The reason we manage these European honeybees is because they produce these big colonies, they produce a lot of honey, they have this critical mass of in, in the, at the peak of the season, probably about now, there's 30 to 50,000 bees in a honeybee colony. Most of the other pollinators are called solitary bees uh, that uh, maybe have small, small nests or individuals. Uh, bumblebees at, at the peak of the season maybe have 500 uh, individuals in a colony. So there's just not enough of critical mass for these bees to do a whole lot in production agriculture. Not that they don't help pollination, but, you know, a million acres of almonds, you can't do it. We haven't figured out how to use these other bees, only honeybees. All right, you got it? Um, why hasn't, like, the rural mite, like, adapted? Well, it's only been here since 1987. And one of the problems, and that's a great question, because if we hadn't done nothing, you know, Darwin would have ruled here. You know, somebody would have survived in one form or fashion. So using miticides, these pesticides, actually has stopped that evolution, if you will, of this relationship between the varroa as a parasite and the honeybee because it hasn't had to adapt. Before varroa mites, honeybees were wild animals. Uh, they just kind of tolerated us. They would live in these boxes that we gave them. But if they didn't like it, they could go someplace else, you know, the hollow tree or something. Um, now, because of roa mites, they're livestock. They have to be managed. They have to be treated. Because if you don't, then they're going to die. So the whole, the whole thing has changed. Yes, ma'am. This is a very basic question, but I'm here to learn. Sure. Explain. I've seen the honeycomb. Tell me how they do it. They take the honey out. How do they do what they do and get it in the jar? <laughs> okay. All right. So they, they visited the flower. They brought the nectar back. They put it in those cells, and they've evaporated by fanning their wings and what have you. They evaporated the moisture out of that nectar to reduce it so that that honey is, is being able to be preserved. And then they'll put a wax capping over it, like a lid, uh, once that's ready to be as stored honey. So when the beekeeper wants to harvest that, the beekeeper leaves on enough honey for those bees to make it through the next winter. He or she just harvests the, the surplus above and beyond that. They will take that frame with that cap and they'll use a knife and they'll cut those cappings, those lids off those cells to expose the honey. And then that frame is put in a, a, a device called an extractor, which is like a centrifuge. And when you put that frame in there and spin it around, that centrifuge forces that honey out of those cells and you can collect it in this, in this container, this vessel, and then you just put it in a jar and, and you sell it. And then you take that frame out and give it back to the bees, and maybe they'll refill it for you. And nothing's added, and they don't have, like when you can, you have to sterilize, you don't have, they don't have to do that. No, they found, they found honey in uh, the pharaoh's tombs. Because it, it's hygroscopic, it's very thick, that an organism, if it tries to grow in there, because it, the honey's so dry, it sucks the moisture out of bacteria and kills them. So nothing can live in it, fungus or anything else. So it's, it's preserved for just about ever. How do they know how much honey the bees need to live? Generally, you know, and, and we've been beekeepers for a long time, and so um, beekeepers know this. Like, for instance, here in Missouri, 50 pounds or so uh, is, is generally considered a good number. 
anything above that uh, the beekeeper can harvest and and 50 pounds is generally in in one of those boxes anything above those boxes can be be harvested and then of course the beekeepers is monitoring the colonies over winter uh, because he or she wants those to survive because that's uh, you know some type of income or pleasure at the other end of, of winter as well. Okay, I think uh, now would be a good time to end questions for now and thank our speaker one more time. <laughs>